Good morning, everyone. And I would like to start with, first of all, congratulating all of you that you've gone through two really long days of training with a lot of information. And you've made it to day three, and you're on your final home stretch. Well, when I see you know, data validation on the last day of the agenda, I'm generally never happy because nobody wants to hear us at this point. But the good part is that you have been hearing all these terms, data quality, NHS and alerts, validation, and you've been primed enough. So hopefully, we'll be able to go through it fairly easily. And um, I look forward to sharing some of the toolkits that we have been working, and hopefully these would be uh, helpful to you. So um, in the next hour, um, we will be talking about validation, uh, both you know, internal and external validation of the long-term care data. I am Suparna Bagchi. I'm the subject matter expert for HAI data validation, and I belong to the protocol and validation team. And along with my colleague, Bonnie Norick, um, we will be sharing some of the guidance and toolkits that we provide. So we, both of us, myself and Bonnie, are, as I mentioned, members of the protocol and validation team. And what we do is we work with not only with patient, uh, acute care settings, we work with the long-term care, outpatient dialysis. And as, an, as more and more components are being added to NHSN, and they have been in the field for a while, we want to provide guidance to do some data quality checks and how validation to be, uh, should be done so as to assure that the quality of data that is being entered in NHSN is of good quality. So we'll start with, in this session, we, I'll talk um, about some of the qualities of a good HAI surveillance system with reference to the long-term care setting and the importance of conducting data validation. And we'll spend the majority of our time in discussing the two types of uh, data validation, which are external data validation as well as the internal. So just a quick recap of some of the information that you've already heard in the last couple of days, that within the long-term care components, there are three modules, um, the healthcare-associated infections, which covers the reporting of urinary tract infections, both catheter and non-catheter related, the laboratory um, lab ID event, uh, which includes the reporting of MDRO and uh, C. diff, infections, and the prevention measures which allows the facilities to monitor the adherence and um, to prevention practices such as hand hygiene and gown and glove use. So you've already heard about the types of facilities that are eligible for reporting their data through via the NHSN. So if you are belong um, to a certified skilled nursing facility or a nursing home, or you are involved in providing immediate and chronic care to developmentally disabled, then you're already uh, reporting data to all the three modules. And the assisted living facilities and the residential care facilities, you're currently um, providing data, or it's limited to the prevention measures. So if you belong to the, the first two categories, bullet, bullets in this uh, slide, then as you're reporting data, you should be also considering doing ongoing data quality checks as well as validating the data that is being reported. And we've gone through this um, in the last couple of um, days, as well as Buffy Prime this, this morning, that the NHSN enrollment of the nursing homes has gained um, quite a bit of momentum during the last few years. When this, uh, this was general, just started in, back in 2013, it was about 1.1% of the nursing homes that were enrolled for reporting. By middle of June this, uh, 2016, this grew to about 2.4%. And then by end of the uh, 2017, it grew to almost 20% of all the nursing homes across the United States. 
So with the increasing number of facilities that have been reporting data, it does become more and more important for us to provide um, guidance and toolkits to be able to assure and assess the quality of data. I think Buffy has done already a good job in and a, a lot of detail in describing the CDI nursing home project, so I do not need to really go into the detail. But what I want to touch upon in that baseline uh, phase of the first nine months of the data, we saw that approximately 98% of the facilities had reported at least one month of complete data. 78% of the facilities had reported nine consecutive months of data. And among these, about 55% had reported zero events. Now, this may be actually very true, but it also generates questions on data quality that is it really true that more than half of the nursing homes had zero CDI events in nine months of 2017? So let's talk about some of the qualities of, of a surveillance system. Similar to several other surveillance systems, healthcare associated infection surveillance, this is an ongoing systematic collection and analysis of data followed by interpretation and timely dissemination of the data. And these data are extremely essential for planning and implementation of prevention measures. A good quality surveillance system requires that it is simple for the users, the definitions are objective, it is flexible to any uh, changes that need to be made with, uh, with time, it has a good data quality, it is acceptable to the users, it has, it's sensitive and has a high positive predictive value, it is representative of the population that it targets to measure, the data that is coming in is timely and it is stable over time. In today's session, we will be discussing mostly on the data quality aspect of the surveillance system. So when we talk about data quality, we are generally referring to two things which are the consistency and the validity of the data. By consistency of data, we mean the completeness timeliness, and having confidence on your own facility's data. Whereas the validity refers to how accurate the data is. So by accuracy, we mean that if somebody else goes in and reviews the chart, and are they being able to determine the same case determination as you did that. And these attributes, both the consistency and the validity of the data, can be achieved by HAI data validation. So it's possible that most of you in the room over here have already heard about both the two types of um, data validation, but if you have not, so we generally classify the data validation as internal and external validation. The internal validation is a built-in process by, within the reporting facility. So in this type of validation, the facility is doing continuously data quality checks, several of them that Buffy already alluded to in her presentation, that to look for errors in reporting. So examples of these are, are there some critical elements of data which are mi missing? Are there data elements which, is being, which are being entered in NHSN which are just implausible? So these are routinely built-in checks that uh, the facility conducts to make sure that before the data is submitted to NHSN, um, they are as correct and complete and as much as possible. The second time, uh, type of external data validation is always conducted by an external agency such as the state health department or maybe even the Quinn QIOs within your uh, region. This process involves generally selecting a sample of facilities, uh, followed by selecting a sample of medical charts at the facilities, and then there is an on-site um, visit 
which includes medical chart reviews, as well as conducting um, a survey with the on-site um, key person who is responsible for data submission in NHSN. And by doing this, what we are trying to attempt is to look at how accurate the data is, learn about the current practices and the knowledge and behaviors or attitudes of the facility in their data reporting methods. and. Uh, to be able to identify what are the systematic errors, what can be remedied over time. And as I mentioned, both of these methods, uh, we would like to remind you uh, always that none of these are punitive in nature. They are just pro uh, different types of processes to be able to assist the facility to um, help in more correct reporting over time. Both of these types of validation are interrelated. When, you, when the facility continuously um, conducts internal validation, and by the, those including cons data consistency checks, looking at the completeness and the timeliness, what you do is you improve your data quality. And then over time, that also in, uh, improves your ability to um, pass your any external validation if you may be targeted for uh, by an external agency. So you're improving your data accuracy in the long run. Both of these processes uh, we understand are uh, the internal as well as external validation are extremely time consuming and all we do by providing you guidance and toolkits are add more work to your already busy schedule, and we understand this. However, I'd like to go through some of the reasons why we still recommend that ongoing validation is extremely important. Firstly, validation helps you to measure the accuracy of the data that are reported by your facility. The data that is reported by your facility is generally used to identify the priorities of prevention measures. And for your prevention to be um, successful in the long run, it is extremely important for you to have the most accurate form of data available. Validation also identifies any barriers to complete and accurate data collection and reporting, and would identify needs for any additional training. When you continue to do to be to be valid and to validate your data, you would be able to identify where are the gaps. Is it some lack in understanding of the protocol? Is it application of the protocol and definition? And you should be able to identify, you know, whether there are more training needs, um, and what kind of errors can be easily remedied. And finally, we at CDC, who are, you know, we are providing you with all the guidance to conduct the validation as well as the protocol and the definitions, we seek your feedback that where are the systematic errors? Is it lack of understanding of some components of the definition or is it simply that more training are needed? And we would like to be able to translate some of your findings into improving both the protocol and definitions of a the particular module, and as well as in assisting you in being able to um, gain the best quality data for your agency. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll be spending most of our time um, going through the methodology of both the external and internal validation. And um, so I will start with the external validation at the long-term care setting using the examples of um, CDI data validation. Uh, we have been working on this uh, toolkit for uh, the past few months. And uh, we are still in the process of actually posting the toolkit on our NHSN websites. Unfortunately, as of today, I do not have a location to share with you that here's where you can go and find the toolkit. However, if, if your facility is considering conducting data validation, feel free to reach out to us. In the meantime, we'll be happy to share the tools and the guidance uh, with you. And you should expect to see this, I, I believe, within the next couple of months um, on the NHSN long-term care website. 
So generally, the external validation activities are grouped into three categories, which include the pre-site visit activity um, on-site and then the post-site. So the pre-site visit generally includes, firstly, kind of selecting a sample of facilities, reaching out to them, inviting them to participate. This is followed by once the facility has accepted to participate in the validation, re um, receiving the line list of the residents that were um, at that facility during the validation time frame, uh, doing a medical record selection, which is also a sample of medical records within that facility, and simultaneously freezing your NHSN data for the validation time frame prior to going to the on-site for the validation chart review. And I will be going through in detail each of these components. The on-site activities are the activities when you're actually visiting the site, you would be conducting the chart reviews and then tallying it with the frozen data. On-site activities also include conducting a survey with the key staff member who is responsible for NHSN reporting. And this is followed by post-site visit activities, which includes conducting the analysis of the data, both at the facility level as well as on an aggregate level, and then uh, writing down a summary to share it with the facilities. And within this summary, you do want to discuss the errors that were found in the reporting and some and how that can be easily remedied and clarifications in the protocol, which might be helpful for the facility to make sure that such errors are not made in the future. Doing on the time. Okay, so let's go through some of the pre-site visit. Since it's too time consuming and resource consuming also to visit every nursing home to validate your data, we recommend selecting a sample of facility. Our guidance provides a recommendation of using a targeted sampling approach. And by targeted sampling approach, what we do is we focus on the larger nursing homes with greater than 100 beds. While the reason why we take this approach is we want to assure that uh, the resident, with an assumption that the higher resident population would also lead to higher number of expected HAI events at the facility. And we also want to ensure that there is an adequate patient sample is available when you are going on site to conduct your validation. This does come with some limitations. So targeted sampling generally uses less resources, provides us the maximum re uh, returns for us to get a snapshot of what's the accuracy. However, the results obtained from this type of validation sampling is that the results are only generalizable to the facilities that were selected in the sample. Remember, these are generally not uh, generalizable to all the facilities across your state. We want to, be st to start with this kind of an approach. We want to receive your feedback on how this process goes. Uh, is this already too burdensome? And then in future years, we look forward to moving to a more random sampling approach, which would, be, which would allow you to be able to generalize your findings. So as a first step of sampling, we start with creating a distribution of the nursing homes within the, your state and stratifying them by the number of bed sizes. So what I have on this slide is just a snapshot of the number of nursing homes by state and that data has been stratified by the different bed sizes. So when you're looking at your state, you would be actually just looking at one at your particular state. And this is just for the uh, sake of illustration that we have a sample for, of different states. So as a next step, if your state consists of less than 50 nursing home uh, or long-term care facilities, this you can skip the step and I will come back to this in a minute. This is for if your state has greater than 50 nursing homes, you want to add the number of nursing homes which belong to the category of greater than 100 beds and compute the total number of facilities. This will become your sampling frame. So let's look at this. For example, in Arizona, there were 145 total facilities. However, there are 91 facilities that belong to greater than 100 beds. 
So 91 becomes your sampling frame. Once you have your sampling frame, then how do you do your facility selection? So I want to focus your attention to the extreme right side, the table of the facility selection. So let's go back to if your state has, is an extremely small state and has less than 50. If it's an extremely small state, for example, it's Alaska, which has only 18 facilities. So if it's less than 20 facilities, you do nothing except just go ahead and select all the facilities and for your validation sampling. If you belong to Delaware, which has 46, so it's less than 50 facilities, then we recommend that you randomly select 20 facilities. The next bigger state is Arkansas, which has 229 overall facilities. However, 141 met the criteria of greater than 100 beds. So this puts us in the category of 50 to 200 facilities with greater than 100 beds, and you randomly select 10% of the facilities. Georgia has 357 overall all facilities, whereas when this was limited to the sampling frame, they were 222 facilities, and this falls into our fourth category of 200 to 500. You randomly select 5% of the facilities that fell into the sampling frame. And if you're one of the larger states like Florida that has 689 facilities whereas and 521 uh, fell into the greater than 100 beds criteria, so you basically fall in the last criteria um, category where your sampling frame has greater than 500 facilities. So we recommend that you randomly select 2.5% of the facilities. So I know that was complicated, and so let's recap. So if you're a smaller state, for example, Alaska, 18 facilities, you just select all of them. Delaware had 46 facilities, you still fall under the 50 nursing home criteria, you randomly select 20 of them. Arkansas, where it started with 229, 141 fell into the sampling frame, you take a 10%, so you would be sampling a total of 14 randomly selected facilities. Georgia had 222 facilities that fell into the sampling frame, so 5% of that would be 11 facilities that would be randomly selected. And Florida being one of the larger ones, where 521 fell into the category, um, so you take a 2.5% sample and of the 521, and this gives you with 13 randomly selected um, facilities. So this was probably the slightly complicated part of um, the talk today and hopefully from now onwards it's going to be relatively easier. So once now that you've selected your facilities as a next step you want to invite them to participate. We provide some of these letters in our toolkit so and if you uh, need feel free to reach out to us and it's in the template what we do is that you want to at this point address it to the facility manager. Uh, here you're soliciting their participation. You're, you would want to describe the importance and the usefulness of their participation in general of the data validation project and explain the, pro the, the process that's going to be involved over the next few uh, weeks. So after you send out your first invitation, hopefully you would have um, received an acceptance, and then by the, by the second letter, you are going to be confirming the date of your site visit, and this would be a preparation phase to, to let the facility know what to expect on the day of the site chart, on the day of the on-site visit. So the second uh, letter would be also directed to the facility manager, and um, where you would reach some kind of a mutually agreed on date of the site visit. You definitely want to let them know that the process is expected to be least disruptive to their daily activities. And you want to discuss some of the, um, what are the on-site needs, especially that you would need an access to the patient charts on the day of your site visit.
If the facility maintains electronic medical records, you want to request them to set up some kind of login for the reviewers. Generally, we recommend that two to three validators um, visit on, on the on-site visit so as to be able to complete your all your chart reviews as well as the um, interviewer survey within a particular day. day. So you want at least two to three people's uh, login, uh, user ID and passwords to be set up in advance. Um, you will be interviewing the key person that is responsible for the uh, data entry into the NHSN. So you want to make sure that based upon their daily routine, you're able to, you're flexible enough to fit into their day. And in addition to this, with this um, letter, you are also going to request the list of the patients or the residents that uh, were at that facility for the validation time frame. So let's look at the medical uh, record selection. So, at, so by medical record selection, we mean basically selecting the residents whose, patient, uh, whose charts that would be reviewed. So you want to, as I mentioned in the le second letter, you're requesting a line listing of all, um, since we're using the example of C. diff, all the toxin positive C. diff uh, stool specimens for the validation time frame. We recommend that you validate at least two quarters worth of data to make sure that you identify, you're able to identify enough events as well as candidate events. Um, the residents that would be included in your sampling frame for the patient selection would be all the fat white end residents or other residents that had an emergency de uh, department visit or physician office visits provided the resident returned on the same calendar or the following calendar day. In addition to receiving just the patient information and their um, and the resident ID number, we provide um, a template which is in the highlighted section below, which includes information of their admission, um, date of admission to the facility, specimen collection date, result of the, um, of the CDI toxin, and some of the patient um, demographic information. And you should strongly encourage the facilities to provide this in an Excel format, because these are some of the variables that are going to be useful and help uh, needed for conducting the cross match with your NHSN frozen data after your chart reviews are completed. So once you've received the line list of the patients uh, or the residents that were at the facility uh, with their, for your validation time frame, um, the, the medical record selection criteria is fairly simple. We just want you to number them from one through X and randomly select 60 resident charts for your chart review. Um, I just want to point out that if you're also, if you've, uh, any of you have been also involved in the patient safety, this step is different definitely from the acute care setting. In the acute care setting, we do a sample A and a sample B. So in the first sample, we look at the first positive test and then the sample B, we look at the subsequent. Whereas in the long-term care setting, we are only selecting 60 randomly selected residents. However, if this random selection process leads to selecting multiple residents uh, for that same time frame, we do want you to um, replace them with du uh, the duplicate records by additional random selections. And as a last step to your pre-site uh, pre activities, uh, what you would be doing is NHSN data freeze. Once the facility has agreed to participate in the validation, you want to fr freeze the data for that validation timeframe for that facility and extract it. Um, you have two options. You can carry it with you on the day of the site visit, or you could keep it with you to come back and refer to it. So once the chart reviews are completed and you've made your case determinations, you're going to tally this with tally your the reviewer determination with what was entered in the uh, in the data in NHSN by the facility, which is in your data frozen data, to make your determinations of the overall accuracy of reporting. 
As I mentioned, you could carry it to the facility. However, just be careful that um, you do not look at this until all the charge reviews are completed to avoid any potential bias of uh, case determination for your reviewer. I think that's where my talk ends, and it'll be continued by Bonnie. We will come back to questions. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Saperna. Um, we're going to continue for the next few minutes to talk about the external validation. And for those facilities who have not participated in the external validation, when the opportunity arises, when someone sends you that letter, I would encourage you to do so. It's a very educational event. So we're going to talk about two activities that will be conducted by the validation team while on site at your facility. The first is collecting data through the review of the resident's medical records. The second is administering the staff survey. NHSN has developed forms for both of these activities. The first form we're going to look at is called an MRAT, a medical record abstraction tool. The tool is collecting data during the on-site review of the facility resident's medical record. The data is used to determine whether the CDI events were reported to NHSN correctly. The form follows the NHSN long-term care facility CDI lab ID event protocol definitions, methods, and algorithms. It is designed so that you can typically use one form per resident for the validation period. The MRAT contains three sections. The first section has to do with the facility and the resident information. Record identifying information about the resident and the date of the first admission in this section. For residents that have both the first and a current admission dates, you will record the current admission date in section C. The section B, or our second section, is a chart review information that specifically captures what's going on with the medical record review. You'll capture the auditor's name as well as the start and stop times of the medical record review. In the uh, section C, in this area, we're going to access the completeness and the accuracy of the numerator data. Was it reported? What was the ascertainment by the facility? You'll want to capture specimens collected from the ED and from the outpatient area settings during the resident's admission. Make sure to record the current admission date in the section to ensure the correct event determination. It is helpful to have a calendar available to you to determine which specimens are duplicates. Duplicates are less than 15 days since the last positive specimen. The last two columns in this section are provided so the facility can have feedback on the accuracy of their data. A few things to note about this process. Observe for systematic reporting errors or poor interpretation of definitions that were applied. If trends are identified, ask that all identified reportable and reported events be reviewed, not just those that are being reviewed by the auditor. It may be that there was a change in the IP, maybe there was a change in the protocol that the IP was not cognizant of. Document and categorize errors with the thought in mind these are areas for improvement to assist in future trainings. This is not a punitive process and I cannot stress that enough. The design and the attitude should be one that this is an educational process with the goal of improving quality of data collection, reporting, analysis, and ultimately the prevention of infection. The second form is the on-site surveillance practice survey. The survey should be administered to the primary person or people responsible for all aspects of NHSN surveillance and reporting. CDI event determination, denominator collection, data entry into NHSN, and data analysis. If multiple people perform these roles, please include them in this survey. The survey will take about an hour. The survey is designed to assess the facility surveillance and reporting practices and the staff's understanding of the CDI lab ID event protocol. The questions are both open-ended 
and multiple choice. Some of the questions are scenario-based. Some have follow-up questions to elicit more information and to have a conversation. If there is a correct answer in the question, it will be bolded. If you plan on sharing these forms with the individuals who are participating, make sure you unbold the answers. There will be notes to the interviewer in this survey. These notes provide information that can be shared with the interviewees for educational purposes during the survey. The survey contains four sections. The first section has to do with the facility and NHSN information. This section is uh, to collect data on the staff involved in CDI reporting and how they use NHSN. The section uh, on B, our second section, has to deal with how uh, admission dates and denominator data is collected. The questions in this section assess the staff's understanding of CDI denominator definitions and the facility's denominator collection practices. The third section is your CDI lab ID events. The questions in this section assess the staff's understanding of lab CDI and event definitions that the facility case surveillance practices. Additional questions are at the end to identify areas of NHSN improvement. Yes, we want to improve ourselves also in the tools that we use. This feedback is very important to give to NHSN. The staff survey is very important. It's an opportunity to partner with the facility, with your QIOs or your state health departments for increasing data quality through both education and process improvement activities, looking at understanding of the definition, surveillance and data collection and validation. Very much interactive. Again, this is not a test. It's a method of communication and learning. Please send NHSN feedback on the MRATS and the survey tool to us, and that will help us to improve our tools for the future. Post-site activities. Now there's a nice little table here. We're gonna talk about data analysis. This is a guidance for collecting your data during the medical chart review. From each of the chart reviews, you're going to lay out data in a two by two table format. It makes it easier to combine data across the sites for an aggregated two by two table. So let's look closely at this table. It is not high level math. It is simply addition and division. So let's look at our true positives, which are in field A. It's counted and recorded. We include CDI events, which were reported by the facility to NHSN, and also the auditor said, yes, these were true events, and they were reported. In field C are our false negatives. These are events which were missed by the facility, but the auditor determined that these were events and should have been reported to NHSN. We call these uh, miss, missed, and underreported. You'll hear that quite frequently. False positives are events which were overreported. Facilities reported these as CDI events in NHSN, but the auditor determined that these should not have been reported. In field D are our true negatives. Facility did not report them, and the auditor agreed that they should not be reported. Now we're going to use this data and compute four data accuracy measures, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predicted value. So hang in there with me. Here comes the, the math part. How good is our process? This is what it's all about. Is our process of surveillance doing what it's intended to do? So let's look at specificity. It's the ability to test correctly and identify those without the disease the true negative. So we have 206, oh, I'm sorry, we have 10 true positives and our sum of A plus C is 14. Divide that and we have 71%. So when you went to grade school, they called that about a C, right? So it's not bad, could be better. Specificity, the ability of the test to correctly identify those without the disease. 
our true negative rate. So we have 266 out of a possible 286. You divide that, that's 93% for our specificity. Well, that's pretty good, that's an A, right? We wanna have this as close to 100% as possible. So let's look at our positive predictive value. What's the value in this process based on our data? It's the proportion of individuals who test positively, that's A divided by the sum of A plus B, and truly have the disease. So we have 10 true positives divided by 30, and we end up with 33%. That's not so good. Our negative predictive value is the proportion of individuals who have tested negatively, that's your field D, divided by the sum of C plus D, and truly do not have the disease. So we have 66 divided by 270, and that's 98.5. Who would not want to have a test score of 98.5? So that's good. So what is our data showing us? We, we have a little bit of problem with over-reporting, right? So in order to make improvements, you must have a measure. You can't just have a gut feeling. We need to have the data, right? So from this scenario, the facility would need to know why are we over-reporting. For each misclassified case, the auditor selects a reason for the error. This information provides feedback to NHSN for future education and training. So let's look at reasons for under-reporting events. We may have an incorrect understanding of the protocol definition or laboratory records were missed or reasons for over-reporting. We have an incorrect sample that we're comparing it to with a, um, maybe too many duplicate records reported. In your packet, there will be an example letter to provide the summary and an explanation to the IP leadership and any additional stakeholders in your facility. Provide instructions for data correction action plans if necessary, and include recommendations for improvement solutions such as annual training, online training, or additional resources the IP can use. This is a timeline for activities. It takes about 24 weeks to work through all this, the selection of facilities, writing your letters, getting your letters back. This is not written in stone. It's just a template for you to use to know what you're gonna be doing throughout the few months that you're involved in these activities. And some of these tasks will go quick and some not so quick. So now we're going to talk about internal data quality checks for your long-term care facility. So now we're going to switch gears. We're going to address this to the facilities. You can do these things yourself. You can pull these reports. Data are considered complete in NHSN when you have your monthly plan submitted. Your reportable events are submitted to NHSN. And if you have none to report, be sure you click that box. And I know you've heard that a lot over the last two and a half days. And your summary data is reported, and that's your patient days and your admissions. Develop a hard copy monthly and for the schedule for inputting this data and check it off when it's complete. I know personally when I have been on the other side of collecting data, that's exactly what I did. I had a little book, I had categories, and when I was done with that particular facet of reporting, I would check it off. There was two of us in the office, so when I checked it off and I wasn't there, my coworker knew exactly what I had done. You can put your plans in quarterly, every six months, or annually, it's your choice. Make use of the copy previous button. Oh, that's a wonderful feature. When I started out, they didn't have that. So make use of that previous copy button. Sometimes summary data may not be available to you right away. So you can lose track of time. I know for myself, my biological random access memory is kind of full. So use what tools to make it work. By performing these internal checks, you'll be able to pinpoint trends and identify data validity and quality issues. So here are the reports I was talking about. Both the facilities and the Quinn QIOs can pull these, but I'm targeting your facilities right now. Always generate data sets prior to creating your reports. This will ensure data is up to date. Anyone who creates a report 
has to generate data. So if there's two in the office, make sure that everybody does generate reports before they're, um, they start doing that analysis. So let's take a look at the page in NHSN. Clicking on the Analysis tab on Reports will open and you will see this folder. The reports that we are interested in are in that advanced folder. We are going to be looking at the event level, the summary level, and data plan and facility data. These reports here are listed to help you verify your monthly plans and when you put your event data in and your summaries. Again, always generate your data. So let's look at line listing facility survey data. When you uh, select modify, remember when you do that, you will add a title, a date range, how you want it printed, whether it be HTLM, PDF, Excel, or rich text format like Word, and then select Run. And I'm not gonna say that for every one of these reports because you already know that, right? So here is a data table that comes from the annual survey that was submitted to NHSN. The annual survey summary is important to verify whether the correct information has been included with your CCN number, very important, number of beds, because you're going to use that to check out your average daily census. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Note here that we were missing our CCN number, but we do have our patient days, our patient beds in there. When you're missing your CCN number and you're submitting to CMS, that's not a good idea. And you also want to make sure that you have your correct beds in here. You may have added a unit you may have inactivated a unit, so make sure that this number is correct on your survey. How often should you pull this report? I would pull it after you submit your report to NHSN. I would also pull this report if you have a new IP that's coming on board. They need to know where this information is and why it's important. Verify the plan has been entered. Uh, I suggest quarterly. You can do it as much as a year as we talked about before. So now we're going to talk about line listing monthly reporting plans. The monthly reporting plan line list provides a summary of the monthly plans that were entered into your facility. Are there yeses where, the report, report, where they are appropriate? Note that I selected, it's probably too small for you to see, but I selected January through December, expecting that we were using uh, an annual schedule for putting those plans, but I didn't get all 12 months. Note that there are some Ys missing. So did we really add too many Ys? Are we missing some Ys? Did we just select that we're not going to do that those months because we have people on vacation? You know, what's the story? So be sure you contact your IP if you are a Queen QIO, if you're pulling these reports, or if you're in quality assurance and you need to contact that IP about this uh, uh, monthly report, find out what's happening. <coughs> this is a screenshot of how to do line listing for all events. Note for this report, I asked for January through June. Only February and April had events. So what's the story with this? Did we really do good in prevention and we didn't have as many infections? Note that in April we had three sooties caused by catheters. So is this all in one unit? This gives us a lot of clues about what's going on. We want to look at this data. If no events are reported, remember to, um, you need to follow up with your nursing home with, or with your IP. Did you submit any stool specimens for C. diff testing to the lab? I think that's also on here. Uh, line listing for all summary data. We're going to take a look at that. Remember when I said that your facility beds is very important on your summary data? If you look here, the number of residence days are about 2,800. So you can guesstimate if you have um, 100 beds in your facility and you have a 30-day month, you have about 3,000 residence days possible, right? Not more. So we have 2,800 here. So we've done a pretty good job in pulling that data. 
Common errors in the monthly summary data include entering zero for residence days, incorrect numbers for residence days, or missing events. And I know we've talked a bit about that across the few days that you've been here about missing events. So let's take a look at that column, missing events. We have Y's and no's there. So does everybody, everyone remember what those Y's and N's mean? If you have an N, it means that the events entered into NHSN for the month. So there are events entered. If it says no events equals Y, no events to report for the month. That means there's nothing to, nothing happened. If it's blank, we have incomplete or missing events for the month. The CDI event in incorrectly entered as part of this number of admissions on C. diff treatment. You had a little discussion about that earlier today, so I won't add into that. Look for possible inconsistencies. For example, the number of admissions on your C. diff treatments. And you have seen this several times, right? But it doesn't hurt to go back over that. If you have a survey incomplete, go back and complete it. If you've got missing events, did you forget to check that box? Or are they incomplete? And the incomplete summary data, do we have patient days in there? Do we have our admissions? Can't hurt to look at those. So make this landing page your friend, because it is. Having credible data prepares you for excellent prevention of healthcare-associated infections. We all want to have A's at the end of the day. We want to keep our patients safe. For one day, you and I will be on the other side of that stethoscope. Validation will provide the path to continuous improvement of our prevention practices. And I thank you. And one person you haven't seen today, Jennifer Watkins, is part of our team. She can wave. And I'm going to get Saparna up here, and we'll answer any questions if you have any. Are there any questions for the speakers? Hi. I just wanted to um, ask a question about this very last slide because of, of our customary approach, which is to contact the generic CDC NHSN. So we can contact you directly? Generally, for most of the questions, questions are sent through the NHSN mailbox. Um, and we provide these mainly, so if you are considering doing the validation, and in the meantime, since we're still in the process of posting the toolkits, okay. and if you uh, are in need of any of the tools and the guidance, please feel free to reach us. Or if okay. you have questions while you're doing your validation that you know my facility does not want to resp respond, or how can we help? So That's wonderful. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any other questions? When do you um, what, when do you anticipate that we would start doing the external evaluations? I'm from a Quinn QIO. There are there are a couple of states already on the field who are performing these. So if you are ready at any point of time, reach out to us. Um, we'll be happy to share all of these resources to you. So and any time. Is there an end point when when the validation when you would want to have all your data collected and done for this validation piece, like? The validations are ongoing process. So, okay. you know, you might decide to do that, an external validation every year. Okay. Um, it's depending on your need. Okay. I just didn't know if this was kind of part of a pilot that you wanted to see kind of how the nursing homes were doing and have this data back to you at a certain point in time. So, no. Okay. No. So, these are ongoing. We, if you have the resources and if you keep on, like, you know, until you are able to resolve the problems, we would suggest do it every year if possible, but okay. it's entirely based on availability of resources. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.